Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, start with the session two. This one is for the speaker. That's working. Okay, so uh, we're continuing, and um, please grab a seat because only then we can go to lunch in time. And uh, I really want to go to lunch. So, but if you want to have discussions, it's also fine. By the way, if you want to really have some private discussion, there's this room here where we have the demos later. Uh, you can also go there, and then it's. Uh, more silent for you. Okay, I hand over to Mario. Good morning, everyone. As we start now the session two of uh, the Open Source CubeSat workshop, my name is uh, Mario Castro de Lera, and I'm a spacecraft operations engineer in the Sentinel 3 flight control team mission. Um, and I will, by the way, your uh, guide for the ECHO group during the ESOC, uh, ESOC 2. So the next block of presentations is going to be focused in the open source uh, software applied to uh, space and ground uh, segments, but inside we have a uh, um, hardware guest. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Satoshi Ikari, assistant professor of the University of, uh, of Tokyo in Japan. He's uh, uh, especially interested in the attitude control algorithm coding and testing and he's uh, here to present uh, an integrated software framework used for many micro, nano, and picosatellite projects. This uh, framework was created to guarantee the compatibility among the three types of uh, software involved in a space mission. The onboard software, the simulator, and the ground station software. Please, Dr. Yaki. Uh, thank you for a kind introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Satoshi Kari, and I and two other colleagues uh, came from uh, Japan to uh, introduce our integrated uh, satellite so software framework. So first of all, let me show you the current situation of our uh, nanosatellite world. As you know, the CubeSat activity was started from the small university project, uh, but now, the diversity of our uh, nanosatellite uh, community is growing, and many universities are developing CubeSat uh, for the education and technology demonstration. And the big space agencies like uh, ESA and NASA and JAXA are also inter interested in the possibility of the CubeSat. And a lot, a lot of startup, startup companies are constructed, and they are trying to make a new space business. And several developing countries uh, uh, con uh, try to get the space technology by using the uh, yeah, CubeSat development. So yeah, you can see so many uh, players in our community, and we have to uh, collaborate uh, together, and we have to share the knowledge uh, to, uh, for the advancement of our nanosatellite community. And one of the solution is this open source. So that's why uh, I and, uh, of course, you uh, came here uh, to the, this great uh, open source CubeSat workshop. And so I want to uh, talk about today the, our laboratory's uh, software framework. And our laboratory has a yeah, good software framework, and it is suitable for the open source activity. So. But uh, our yeah, but our framework had some uh, issues, so we I need we need uh, some uh, good advice from the audiences. And next, I want to uh, talk about my uh, the history of my uh, laboratories. The in 2003, uh, we developed the first CubeSat uh, 
And from here to now, we have many experiences of the sat nanosatellite development, uh, launching, and uh, operation. Yeah, there are uh, five uh, Earth orbiting nano and pico satellites, and one uh, interplanetary micro spacecraft. And also, we have uh, many, uh, s uh, many uh, future mission plans. And all of these plan uh, mission is a collaborative mission uh, with the Japanese Space Agency and uh, uh, private uh, startup companies and uh, Vietnam, the developing country. So we are already trying to collaborate with many other uh, players, and our proposed framework is used in every uh, project. So we want to expand this uh, collaboration activity to all over the world with you. Yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, we have many nano and micro satellite experiences, but uh, a lot of, uh, at, uh, but at our early project like this, we, have, we had many issues. And first we issue is this, oh, sorry. Yeah, first issue is the, uh, non, uh, the less reusability of the space uh, softwares. And uh, we used uh, different architectures and different softwares for each satellite. So there are so many uh, different uh, OBC hardwares and uh, there are so many, uh, uh, we are using, uh, we, we used so many different programming languages and grass, ground station system is also different. So, it's very confusing, and uh, our team is. Uh, we we think uh, our team has to improve our mind, uh, and we have to share the source codes between this satellite project, and uh, we have to reuse the software uh, to improve the, our uh, reliability of the softwares. And there are other issues, and, and the second issue is the. Uh, simulation, the testing uh, uh, environment, and usually we, uh, uh, so when we want to test the attitude control algorithm, we make the simulation environment inside our computer, and uh, we have to, uh, yeah, check the attitude algorithm. And ideally, uh, we want to use this uh, attitude control directly to the flight uh, or on board computer, but we can't do it because for the flight, soft, uh, flight environment, we have to add uh, some other source codes like the command and data handling and or to you know, or something. So we have to uh, modi modify the attitude control algorithm uh, from the tested one to the flight one. So, and at that time, uh, uh, yeah, we have many bugs for that. And the third uh, issue is the operation software. And in our laboratory, <laughs> usually the operation software, the priority of the operation software is very low because the operation software can be uh, uh, changed uh, after the shipment during the, uh, until the launch. So we couldn't uh, match a good uh, test for the operation software, and uh, there are so many bugs and errors in the, uh, in the operation software. Yes, and so in order to overcome these three uh, issues, we have developed a new uh, software framework for our second generation microsatellites. And it was, uh, yeah, this is uh, my, uh, today's my uh, topic. And uh, it was this framework was already demonstrated on Nobit, and it will be improved uh, uh, and used for our future satellite missions. And finally, uh, we want to publish this framework to uh, our community, the, our CubeSat community, uh, as an open source activity. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the introduction is uh, becomes quite wrong, but from here I'd like to talk about the, our integrated software framework. Yeah, the important point of our framework is integration. The, this framework integrates all software in the satellite project, uh, not only the onboard uh, software, but also the simulation software and uh, operation, the ground station software. So these three softwares are directly connected uh, without huge modification from real flight codes. 
and uh, th because of that, uh, we can uh, test the, uh, we can make the realistic uh, testing environment by using this framework. And the realistic uh, testing environment gives us the effective end-to-end -end development, and this end means the ground station to the fly on board flight uh, soft, uh, source code. And of course, also this uh, t realistic testing environment is very effective for the education uh, for uh, new challengers such as uh, university students. Yeah, and let's go to the detail of the integrated framework. The first component is this onboard uh, software architecture. Uh, we called our architecture as the c 2 a command-centric architecture. And uh, this will be presented by my colleague, uh, Mr. Nakajima, from uh, yeah, at after my presentation. So here I just uh, briefly introduce uh, this architecture. The key words uh, of this c 2 a is high reusability and on-orbit flexible configuration and OBC hardware-free. Yeah, you can use this uh, architecture uh, on the many other hardwares. And uh, all these functions are realized by the yeah, modularized programming. And this, thanks to the modularized programming, C2A is very suitable uh, for open source activity. So next, I'd like to talk about the simulation software. Yeah, this simulation software is a core of our framework. So in the simulation software, uh, uh, the simulation software has a function uh, for attitude and orbit dynamics calculation. And it also has a sensor and actuator uh, mo models and uh, to uh, emulate the communication between sensor and actuator components. Uh, and uh, onboard software. And to make the closed loop simulation, uh, we, have, uh, yeah, we have to add s uh, software which emulates the onboard on software. And for the emulation, we use the C2A architecture. Uh, and due to the modularized uh, programming of the C2A architecture, uh, yeah, C2A architecture, we can uh, easily connect the real on orbit uh, on board so, uh, source codes and the simulation source codes directly. So, of course, the compiler is a little different, uh, but we can use the same codes with the flight model, and we can directly test the flight source codes uh, by using this simulation uh, environment. Yeah, and Furthermore, we also added the emulation of command and telemetry files uh, between the ground station and uh, on, on orbit uh, spacecraft. And now we can uh, now we uh, uh, we uh, we can use the command and uh, telemetry file uh, with uh, compatible with the JAXA's operation software, and uh, we can uh, test the real command file by using this sim simulation environment. And at this time, uh, the simulation software is focuses on the attitude and orbit dynamics. But uh, we want to, uh, we are trying to expand the simulation to the power control system or uh, summer control system. And fin maybe finally, we want to make the virtual satellite in the uh, laptop PC. And the final uh, component is the operation uh, source code. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have the good integration. Uh, we, yeah, we couldn't integrate it completely because we have many, uh, yeah, we have several types of the operation software. Yeah, for this spacecraft, we are using the in-house operation system. And for this spacecraft, we are, yeah, we are using the very expensive commercial operation software. And for this spacecraft, we are using the JAXA's operation system. Yeah, it's very confusing and it, it is a very big issue for our uh, software framework. And we strongly need the open source operation software that which compatible with our uh, framework. So, yeah, I want to, to uh, yeah, yeah, I want to uh, conclude my presentation. And we have uh, developed, uh, we have uh, developed a new integrated frame, uh, software framework uh, by uh, by uh, by using our much experiences of nano and micro de micro satellite, 
And this framework has been already demonstrated on orbit by using this spacecraft. And we, want, we try to improve to use the, these near future spacecraft. And finally, we want to uh, publish this framework at, uh, to the community as an open source activity. But we have the, some issues. I already talked about the uh, issues of operation software. And the other issue is the how to publish the open source community, this uh, framework. Unfortunately, we, our laboratory is not familiar with the open source activity, so we need uh, some good advices from the audiences. And also, I have the yeah, uh, issues. Uh, we, Japanese, <laughs> may, uh, make uh, yeah, source codes by using the Japanese comments. So there are so many Japanese comments. So when we want to open source, uh, we, when we want to uh, publish this open source, we have to translate into English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, I want to some uh, constructive advice from audiences. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Arigato Iraki-san. So, do you have any question? From an uh, operations point of view, I want uh, to see which are your main challenges when you are going to develop the operation software, you are using this commercial one, but is the commercial one from JAXA a standard or how is uh, your approach for the development? So our now approach yeah. uh, for the operation software, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, we also have the in-house operating software, so we want to, exp uh, yeah, we want to improve this software, but it's not good. <laughs> it's not a good software, I think. The, new, the commercial operation software and JAXA's operation, operation software is very good, uh, uh, especially for the GUI. So we want, you want to make some collaboration with other uh, universities or other startup companies to make the new uh, open source operation software. Uh, the simulation part of your framework we were talking about, uh, is, it, uh, is it doing real-time simulation or uh, are you doing uh, the, the onward software in the loop or only the algorithms in the loop? Okay. Yeah. Um, the first, uh, uh, the we have two simulation models. The one is the uh, real-time hardware in the, the loop simulator and the second one is the no non-real-time, the accelerated uh, s software in the loop simulator. And uh, we can use this soft, uh, simulation environment both for the hardware in the loop and the software in the loop simulator. And yeah, for both, uh, even if the software simulator, we don't uh, make, uh, we want, don't want to make uh, a simulator only for the attitude uh, algorithm. Not, not only for the attitude algorithm, but also the all software inside the on board the computer of the spacecraft. So that's the point of our yeah, framework. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I'm sorry, but uh, um, I can add uh, uh, a few um, points uh, because I am colleague of uh, this uh, project. As for yes. um, uh, the uh, operating system, we already made uh, a certain kind of the self um, automatic coding system uh, to, from, uh, to generate from the uh, uh, command and telemetry database to our uh, operating database. And, and simultaneously, we uh, automatically convert into the, um, the onboard software. So uh, we, um, uh, the answer is that um, uh, if we utilize the, um, this kind of, um, of uh, converters for other operating systems, we, we, uh, we can utilize uh, this kind of system or for other operating system also. Arigato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the next speaker. Okay, yeah, thank you for your <laughs> kind attention. I can. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Sintaro Nakajima, a doctoral student of the University of, of Tokyo, a colleague from Mr. Iraki. Uh, he's engaged in the onboard uh, software and of the microsatellites uh, and CubeSats. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, how the 
software integrated uh, is uh, taking into account the onboard software, one called uh, Command Centric Architecture, ACA CQA, and this software has been designed to achieve a high re reusability and uh, onboard uh, flexible reconfiguration capability. Please. Thank you for your kind introduction. So, uh, so I will introduce about uh, our onboard software framework, uh, which is uh, one of the components uh, in the previous uh, presentation. So uh, as uh, Dr. Ikari said in the previous presentation, uh, so we have to, uh, the we have uh, the we have own a new uh, almost software architecture, so I will introduce it. So uh, in the previous presentation, and uh, so we have, uh, we, the University of Tokyo, have the developed these CubeSat and micro satellites uh, since 2003. So we have developed uh, many satellites, but uh, as, uh, as Dr. Ikeri mentioned uh, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, we have developed the onboard software one by one. So since we have developed each of the software independently, so the software uh, needs long development time, and uh, the software is less reliable because we have uh, we have to uh, test again and again. To overcome these problems, a new uh, onboard software architecture for satellite is uh, desired. So we have uh, developed new onboard software architecture called Command Centric Architecture C two way. C2A is a uh, satellite framework uh, which uh, realizes both reusability and flexible reconfigurability by describing spacecraft all function as commands. C2A is used for some uh, small satellites, uh, four satellites and uh, one interplanetary uh, uh, microspacecraft on orbit and three or more uh, spacecraft being developed. The basis of C2A is this. A spacecraft function has a common pattern that's uh, executing a predefined block of process processing at a specific timing. For example, the main loop of, of a spacecraft is a periodic processing for management and control of spacecraft state. Satellites get information from sensors, analyze information from the sensors, and analyze, uh, co analyze uh, commands from ground and generate telemetries, and calculate order for actuators, and send the commands to actuators. These, uh, these actions are performed during one loop of the spacecraft onboard software, and in the next loop, the satellite uh, performs these functions again. Uh, in this example, uh, a specific timing is uh, like a time oriented. The second example is a response to the, an accidental event. If the satellite detects the leak of gas, the satellites executed a block of, a block of uh, processing like this, closing valves and the power propulsion system and move to safe mode. Uh, in this uh, example, a spe specific timing is the uh, uh, event driver. So as you can see from the previous examples, spacecraft uh, actions are performed a specific time and are defined as a group of specific functions. In other words, actions are very similar to time designated commands because they have the same pattern. Functions are performed at a designated time. So we have focused this relationship between spacecraft action and time designated commands. We have developed uh, onboard software architecture for spacecraft based on command functions. In C2A, this architecture, this command means not only an order from the ground, but also uh, an order by itself. Also, C2A aims to standardize and uh, modularize each function. This slide shows the specification and the specific terms of C2A. First, spacecraft actions are defined as block commands. The block commands is a group of time designated commands. In C2A, uh, there are some definition tables which uh, describe the relationships among functions and also describe the uh, contents of the block commands. Also, uh, we, call, uh, we call common functions among satellites as core function, and satellite-specific functions are called applications. This application is a standardized and modularized description method uh, for functions in C2A. 
So this is the schematic of C2A. C2A is consists of some definition tables and functions. The processing of C2A is based on uh, uh, this uh, re relatable definition tables. Thanks to these tables, C2A realizes uh, flexible reconfiguration capability and high reusability. So as I mentioned before, C2A has uh, two major blocks, uh, core functions and uh, applications. So core functions are satellite common function. So uh, as these functions are so uh, these functions are very easy to reuse uh, on other satellites by adjusting only adjusting some parameters. In case of uh, application, application is uh, uh, satellite specific functions. Uh, we have divided to uh, applications uh, three as a viewpoint of data flow. Middlewares uh, depend on uh, OBC. Drivers depend on, uh, components, uh, on comp components on both satellites. And user-defined functions are independent on uh, hardware. So we can reuse uh, user-defined functions easily because it, it that is uh, uh, independent from uh, hardware. Drivers can be reused if you use the same component as previous one. And middlewares can be reused if you use the same OBC. Each function is modularized and standardized as an application, so we can uh, reuse source code easily. And the next advantage of C2A is uh, flexible reconfigurability. To reconfigure uh, uh, conventional onboard software, uh, we have two ways to uh, reconfigure, changing parameters and uh, whole memory rewrite. Among these two ways, uh, there is a major gap in viewpoint of uh, workload and the reconfiguration capability. C2 enables more ways to reconfigure, for example, uh, modifying block command, modifying definition tables, and uh, partially memory rewrite. The last one is uh, realized by the modular, modularized application and definition tables. Next, uh, I will talk about the uh, example of spacecraft which uses uh, C2 way. Hodes 3 and 4 are real microsatellites for Earth observation. C2A has been uh, developed during the development of these uh, satellites and almost completed. On the other hand, uh, Procyon is a micro interplanetary spacecraft. In case of Procyon, we could use C2A from the start of the development of the uh, satellite software. These two are different types of spacecraft. Uh, one is a real microsatellite, and the other is an interplanetary microspacecraft. However, uh, many bus components are common uh, among these spacecraft. So we have aimed to uh, reuse some parts of onboard software of Hodel satellites for Procyon as much as possible by using a C2A. Uh, after the end of Hodel development, the onboard software of Procyon began to uh, Developed. First, uh, we have developed individual functions for communication between the OBC and the uh, components. After completion of the electrical interface test, we have integrated each function to the mainstream of the health check of components during environmental tests. Behind that, uh, behind that software integration, uh, ADCS functions are developed. developed. Then uh, ADCS functions uh, have been integrated to the mainstream of the environment after the environmental test. The final onboard software was uh, installed on uh, 6th November. Uh, so we have completed the development of onboard software in 5.5 months by uh, three students. This table shows the comparison Hodoyoshi with the Procyon uh, in the core function of the onboard software. Some modifications in this table are due to the bug fix and the number of OBCs. Hodel satellites have two OBCs. One OBC is for the attitude control, and uh, another, uh, and the other is for the uh, other functions. But despite the difference of the number of OBCs, uh, as you can see, there is no addition and uh, no addition or deleted functions. Therefore, these two satellites have some core function. According to this, this table, we can apply C2A to different spacecraft, such as rail satellites and the deep space interplanetary spacecraft. This slide shows the comparison of application. Application is the uh, satellite-specific functions. 
the delete of the uh, application is mainly due to the difference of uh, hardware. The addition is mainly due to the addition of the ADCS function and also the addition of the new equipment such as scientific instruments. And the addition of the new function for the deep space, for example, uh, we have to uh, implement autonomous functions. The modification is mainly due to the function modification, modification for deep space and backfix. The most important thing is, is that uh, 15 applications are Exactly the same code, same source code as as Odyssey's application. Since the modi uh, since modified uh, application is based on the Odyssey's application, so we can reuse the almost uh, one third of the uh, Odyssey's application. So after the development, Procyon was launched on December 3rd, 2014. We have operated Procyon successfully, and uh, this ASCII letter is uh, sent from the Procyon. During the operation, we have performed many reconfigurations. For example, we use the, uh, we use the com combination of block commands for operating a uh, propulsion system, and we have modified the main loop of spacecraft for observation by the telescope, and we, we added a new FDIR function uh, of a star tracker and a uh, new application to uh, angular velocity estimation using a star tracker and define the new housekeeping telemetry packet and so on. So what we should do next is uh, demonstrate this architecture on other platforms. We have demonstrated this architecture on orbit, but their OBC is the same uh, model. So we will apply this architecture on different OBC equipped on this satellite these satellites. Actually, uh, C2A has already been applied to these uh, satellites, and uh, we are testing C2A by using these satellites. So lastly, uh, I will summarize this presentation. So we have developed C2A. C2A is the onboard software architecture with flexible reconfigurability and high reusability. This architecture is uh, based on command functions especially block commands and definition tables. C2A has used by uh, some spacecraft on orbit, Hodel satellites and Procyon. The reusability of C2A was demonstrated, demonstrated during the development of Procyon. And the reconfigurability of C2A was demonstrated by the operation of Procyon. C2A will be used for future spacecraft in the University of Tokyo and other, some, other, uh, some other groups. Okay, thank you very much. Arigato Nakajima-san. So questions? So the, let's start there. Uh, so is there a published spec for the C2A? And if yes, where can we access, gain access to it? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I okay. If there exists any public, uh, published uh, spec for the C2A? Uh, so we have not, uh, uh, we have not uh, published uh, for now, but uh, as uh, as Dr. Ikari uh, mentioned uh, in the previous uh, the previous uh, presentation, uh, we want to publish uh, as an open source. But uh, we are now uh, discussing how to uh, how to publish is the uh, best because uh, how can I say uh, one of the disadvantage disadvantage of C2A is uh, uh, there there needs uh, it needs uh, how can I say uh, it needs uh, a little bit. Uh, large uh, running cost because uh, it is uh, a little bit complex. But uh, I think uh, the core function of C2A, that is a uh, uh, satellite common function, is uh, almost, uh, we can uh, adjust uh, that core function by only uh, changing the parameters. So uh, I think, uh, I guess, uh, so I think uh, the core function of C2A should be uh, uh, provided by a uh, kind of the library or something. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Please. Wait, wait, wait please, for the our Streamly live. Thank you. So in the in the beginning, uh, I read that you 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 also try to 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 go online as uh, open source uh, um, in the open source community. Mm -hmm. So if someone outside of Japan would 
like to uh, uh, to, to 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 use your software mm. uh, because you want to test uh, mm. the multi-platform capability. It will be possible to to work with you together and mm. uh, implement your software using hardware that is compatible. Mm. So this would th this would be possible actually. Mm. Thank you. And uh, actually, uh, I uh, we have the experience of the international collaboration is the uh, one of the international collaboration is uh, with the Vietnam uh, Vietnam students but uh, in in that uh, in that uh, uh, collaboration uh, we have uh, we use uh, they use uh, the same OBC as previous one so I think so your comment is very uh, uh, I guess think your comment is very uh, good for us I think Yep. So um, thank you for for your presentation. But uh, I wanted to mention I I, I visited their team, so they have also uh, uh, s very nice facilities. So where you, you have those uh, those uh, white rooms and you have uh, shakers, you have also th um, not thermal vacuum but vacuum and thermal on one side. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you like to to share those facilities? Because I, I know that sometimes you, you, we want to make CubeSats, people want to make CubeSats, but they need facilities to, to test the mm -hmm. CubeSats, the hardware, and the software as well. But but uh, testing the hardware is a hard part, so mm -hmm. sharing facilities. Do you have any plan in sharing the facilities as well? Uh, actually, uh, we have uh, experienced the sharing the facility in uh, some Japanese uh, universities and uh, uh, some Japanese uh, companies. but. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we, we can uh, uh, we can share the uh, testing facility with all over the world. Uh, the but and uh, Japan has one and uh, other uh, testing facility for the micro and the nano satellite in the Kyushu area, other university, and uh, they can uh, they have the. Me mo <laughs> better facilities than us so maybe yeah you can use that facility so if, if you <laughs> want to use <laughs> yeah, if you want to use yeah uh, please contact me yeah I, I will s uh, please contact me I will send to the uh, that university yeah <laughs> thanks for your honesty yeah <laughs> Can I add one please for um, uh, uh, we are willing to uh, share uh, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Uh, we are willing to uh, um, to share the uh, software or the um, the uh, this kind of C two A and the um, uh, uh, the software of the uh, the rarity in the these missions. <laughs> the major barrier is the languages. Uh, uh, we need to translate uh, our, our documents for uh, international model. So we are uh, um, uh, really hope to uh, help us. And uh, actually, and uh, to localize the other platform, and uh, uh, we have a. Uh, we need to uh, sh um, divide uh, two parts of the this um, program. Uh, one is the hardware dependent area, and um, the, um, the other is the application area. Uh, so we um, the, uh, we think that the, um, it is easier to share the, um, the hard, um, application areas, and uh, uh, if we um, the, uh, utilize the same um, the interface between the, um, the um, hardware oriented areas, we can share the um, applications. Uh, that is established in the these missions. Uh, as for uh, the hardware dependent areas, we um, hope to use um, the localize many uh, as mu many uh, platform as much as possible. But uh, we have uh, if we uh, share the, um, the interface, I mean uh, 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 software framework with you, uh, we can um, the, um, uh, the share more applications all over the world. I guess. So um, the, uh, this presentation is intended to um, share how to share the, um, the uh, interface between the uh, hardware-oriented area with the, um, the applications. So um, we not um, intend to the our uh, framework is the best. So that, uh, we can we need to share uh, what kind of interface is best. Uh, it it means that uh, um, your application can be uh, uh, utilized in our platform, and uh, our, our um, software also can be uh, utilized in your platform also uh, if we uh, realize the um, um, common um, interfaces between uh, these kind of areas thank you uh, last question quick question to you uh, maybe yeah <laughs> uh, maybe this could be a 
starting up of a possible development of an onboard standard in terms of interface. We hope so, but uh, it, it, it should be uh, on the uh, uh, sort of start point. Uh, uh, this I really hope that uh, this meeting is a start point of the some kind of the uh, standardization of the um, software, uh, uh, the, the interfaces between uh, um, software application with the uh, subways, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, okay. In my opinion, uh, the standardization of the onboard software and the board interfaces at different layers, at different level, is a, is a crucial element that uh, private companies will are fully, totally against and will not dare. And this type of community here should be, uh, will have the power and the energy to overcome this uh, difficulty. Uh, on ground is easier, but on board everybody keeps for himself. Now this opportunity, I would say, is, uh, should be picked up by everybody to think about how to structure and even uh, work together toward a standard of uh, onboard software. Thank you, Alessandro. Yeah. I also like to add a comment on this because uh, um, there are some activities uh, from NASA, for example, the open, uh, no, the operation system abstraction layer, and also from uh, within Europe, there's this SAWA in initiative, which also kind of wants to um, propose a framework or building blocks for onboard applications. So there are a lot of activities ongoing, but most of them, they're really, I mean, they're involving industry and, and space agencies. So this is a time frame of five to 10 years or maybe more. So maybe th we can use this as an inspiration, what they have done so far, but uh, push this further and make this quicker and realize this quicker uh, in terms of prototypes. And I suggest this should be a working group topic. So please write it here on the flip chart. Thanks. Thank you. Arigato Nakajima-san. I think there is uh, an announcement to, to be done concerning the last presentation of, uh, of the yeah, session. Yeah, this one's presentation is moved to tomorrow. Exactly. So the, the presentation, the fourth presentation of the session two, the is going to be moved for tomorrow. Okay. And then let's go for, for the break in the software exclusively and go to uh, speak uh, a little bit about uh, hardware and software. The next speaker is Piros uh, Papadeas. You know him. He's the founder of uh, Libre Space Foundation with more than 10 years of experience in the open source community. So he's working in a within in a team of uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, collaborators. And uh, the large number of, uh, of volunteer contributors to, to the around the world demonstrate that the, the extraordinary interest of this project. So he's going to tell us how and why the Libre Space Foundation created the first uh, open source software and hardware in the space. Please, Mr. Papadias. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, UPSAT, APSAT, UPSAT, however you pronounce it. Um, so UPSAT um, is basically, well, we are from the Libre Space Foundation, you already know that. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, speaking about the UPSAT, so UPSAT um, is one of the 50, or initially scheduled as 50, QB50 satellites. So QB50 was an FP7 project from the European Union. Uh, Von Karman Institute uh, was actually coordinating the effort of uh, 50 different satellites uh, doing uh, thermosphere studies. So there were three different kinds of sensors and many different academic institutions, universities, uh, around the world, um, mainly in Europe, but also um, uh, it, that was a global project. Uh, we're submitting proposals um, uh, about creating a CubeSat around one of the sensors. Um, so what you would get as an academic institution is basically the sensor for free, some guidance and general um, um, keep, you know, like directions about the project itself, uh, and then a reduced price on the, on the launch, which can be substantial, so that's, that, was, that was great. Um, so one university in Greece, the University of Patras, was actually awarded one of the 50 sensors uh, and set off to um, to create a CubeSat around it. And 
Um, that's the sensor that um, came from uh, VKI. That's a MNLP, multi-needle Lagamoire probe. That's basically um, doing plasma measurements uh, on the thermosphere. You can see a bias probe, electronometer in the center, and then four probes around it uh, that are uh, uh, measuring the charge of, uh, of plasma. Um, and yeah, and then the university decided to go on a way which was quite different from any other, um, um, well, all the other QB50 projects. Uh, and it was instead of just going out and buying, you know, sub-modules of their mission and assembling everything together, they would create everything from scratch, which is audacious and it's, you know, fascinating and exciting, uh, but you also need to have the technical background to actually go about uh, doing such a thing. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the university by themselves could not do that. So they went ahead with the project for a couple of years, like almost two years, until they realized that they needed uh, external help on uh, making this happen. So they reached out to us, um, and that was on November 2015. And by December 2015, we were pretty much, um, you know, kind of like taking over the whole project and redesigning things from scratch. We had a deadline to meet, which was um, really uh, strict. We had to deliver everything by May, uh, and that was extended to June and July and then August. So in August, we delivered it uh, in a typical space, you know, industry fashion, like delays and delays after delays. Um, so basically, the design, construction, integration, testing, and everything else that you're going to be seeing uh, in this presentation happened from December 2015 to August um, 2016, where we delivered uh, the, the satellite. Um, so that's um, a basic overview of the satellite uh, itself. You can see the structure and the different components in there. The SU MNLP, that's the science unit, it's on the left side. Uh, and then you would have the um, electrical power system, the EPS there with the three batteries, uh, the attitude determination and control at the ADCS, the OBC, uh, the comms uh, platform, and then a GPS module, the antennas of the GPS and the antenna system, which is a deployable um, a part of the top of the of the whole structure. So everything in here was designed from scratch, hardware included, software included too, and released as open source licenses, except from the GPS module. So that we couldn't do due to time constraints mostly, but there are other also regulate regulatory um, issues with that. Um, so that's a um, general overview of the architecture um, in terms of the electronics uh, part of the components. So you can see the ADCS, the OBC, the EPS, and the COMS subsystems. All of them are run by um, STM32 um, uh, microprocessor. Um, one of them, the OBC, actually does have free RTOS as an operating system. And everything else is BRC on top of the HAL uh, abstraction layer for um, the STM32. We used CubeMX uh, to generate um, for STM32's um, the HAL layer. And then on top of that, we were writing code um, to implement the different uh, uh, functions on that. Um, the design approach around most of the things has to had to be kind of like done from scratch. Like we had to reinvent the wheel, right? Like there's minimal documentation, especially for um, state of the art kind of like microcontrollers and processes um, around those things. Um, so we took a hard look on what was out there and tried to make you know the best abstractions that we could find. And we made, of course, uh, many mistakes along the way, uh, but we think that you know the end result that it actually worked, um, you know, showcased that uh, so many of the um, decisions that we made were actually um, validated and, and, uh, and correct. And of course, we would change a lot of things in the next mission, and I think that that's part of the um, learning process of uh, doing that and doing that in the open so that more people can learn about your mistakes uh, and what went wrong and what with, uh, went uh, correct. Um, on the application layer, uh, regarding the communication among the, the systems, that would be UART interfaces, um, the lines that you see uh, among the STM32s. Um, so OBC acts kind of like the centralized node, and that's one thing that we should definitely change on the on the next mission. But due to uh, time constraints, we didn't have uh, any more time to invest in a bus-like architecture with any protocol that supports that. Um, and on the application layer of it, um, we took the hard decision to implement the flight software team um, 
Nikitas and uh, Apostolis over there, um, took the hard decision to implement the ECSS telecommand uh, and control um, um, packetization standard. Um, and of course, we could have come up with a much easier um, you know, protocol to, to use for communications, and that includes the space to ground communications too. Um, but we figured that we should make something as reusable as possible. And right now, the core as it is does still you know, apply uh, on future missions, and we can use it in Pure C, and we published it open source, and there's going to be a also a roundtable discussing a lot about that, so please, uh, for everyone that is interested, make sure to join on that one. Um, and, you know, like, typically, like when you have to reinvent everything from scratch, like, you start with pretty much nothing, like a stack of pretty embedded, uh, you know, like, components on, a, on some uh, four roads. And then you gradually go all the way up to, you know, trying to figure out what is this clean thing that we need to do? Like, I don't know, like, let's figure out or let's read the specification, right? Like, we didn't have access to testing facilities, which was important. And a big piece of the actually building the satellite was uh, inventing a lot of the processes, not for the satellite, but everything around that, all the ground support equipment, uh, as we would say. Um, and then gradually the satellite started to um, to take form and, um, you know, we would start working more on the mechanical components of it as the hardware and the software, you know, were developed and we were seeing more and more uh, versions of it. Like, keep in mind that this process is a couple of months process, basically. Um, so the iteration that we had to do was, you know, tremendously fast, both on hardware and software and for the mechanical part, um, uh, obviously. So on the electronics, uh, that's the uh, screenshot from uh, KiCad or KiCad however you pronounce it, um, which is the software that we use to uh, do all the EDA uh, pieces of the um, uh, satellite. That's the comms platform. Uh, you can see the STM32 down there together with the CC1120s. Uh, that's the transceivers for the uplink and downlink, VHF and UHF. Um, and the power amplifier is the noted area uh, up top. And uh, we tried to use to as much extent as possible, only open source software for the design of things, like where we rely on. And I think that we did, except from the thermal analysis. Uh, the thermal analysis was done on Thermica, and that was the only thing that we couldn't do open source. And now there are some developments on FreeCAD, which, by the way, we used for the mechanical uh, pieces of the satellite, um, that uh, there are some developments that might enable us to, to do thermal analysis also on FreeCAD, and we're super happy that we can have like a almost complete uh, workflow using only open source tools. Um, and you can see the obvious, you know, process, like within two months, I think that's the difference here. And you can see the early engineering model on the right side and on the left side, like an almost complete file flight model for the APS uh, subsystem. Lots of iterations, obviously. Um, and the jig itself uh, for the vibration uh, that you will see in a bit. And then try to do all the fit checks um, and everything else. Then at some point when you start compiling, you know, your FM hardware and you start integration, like you need a clean place to do that. Um, and uh, that's not an optional thing. That's a mandatory requirement for many var uh, various different reasons. Uh, so we created the glove box ourselves, like with two, two positions. You see half of it right here. Manthos is in there uh, masking some FM models uh, in order to be um, sprayed on with um, some conformal coating. Um, that's a positive pressure um, class 7, class 8. Uh, I might be wrong on that, but I think it's 7 or 8, any case, uh, clean box. Uh, and of course, the design for the clean box itself and how to construct it and the filters and everything else, we put them online and we would be happy to see people, you know, uh, using it. So we had to resort to some um, commercial and off-the-self testing equipment, like a FLIR, you know, thermal camera to do the tests, and you can see here the uh, power amplifier, like, going crazy, obviously. Um, and then uh, we built three, basically, uh, engineering models in order to distribute them to, to the software engineers so they can work in parallel doing things um, as quickly as possible in an agile way, um, in, uh, in the software development side of things, we actually used Kanban uh, on a daily basis. So we had like daily meetings almost uh, and updates of what was happening. And then multiple engineering models enabled us to move much faster uh, on the people that were working on different uh, components. 
Um, everything, as I said, is already up in GitLab, like all the hardware and software and everything else. And we didn't do that after the end of the project or near the end of the project. We did it from day one. So we actually created empty repositories and had all the process uh, open for everyone. And that was much easier, uh, you know, in terms of the development process, but it was also super influential because implicitly, like when you, and you know, kind, kind of like subconsciously, when you put things publicly, you're more careful about various different things, including commenting, testing, and everything else. So I think that the open first approach is actually super beneficial, has been actually super beneficial uh, to get us to, to the place that we, that we went. And I'm not gonna talk uh, a lot about that. That's the ground segment. Uh, that's the implementation on Python and JavaScript. Um, running on top of GNU Radio for the uplink, basically, and the downlink parts. Uh, that's the command and control uh, Satnox uh, module, uh, implementing the ECSS uh, telecommand and control capabilities. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the delivery pictures. Those are some final tests here. Vibration tests, thermal and vacuum, we had to build it from scratch. Huge learnings there, by the way. Um, and that's the... Uh, thermal test and then the EMC we were like enough like we couldn't build an EMC uh, testing facility yet by ourselves <laughs> we're getting there um, yeah you can see some um, power field measurements there and those are the pre-delivery pictures even the gig the jigs that do you see down there like some companies are selling them for a thousand euros if uh, you know what I mean if you've seen that around uh, we just consulted it over a, um, uh, an afternoon basically um, those are the happy delivery pictures, obviously, and that's the final piece that uh, was assembled uh, on the delivery process. And that's the delivery picture, you know, typically, like every satellite should use have a delivery picture. Um, <coughs> that's the integration picture together with the other satellite there right there, that's a, a French one, FR07, uh, 04. And then at some point, after wait and wait and wait and wait again, uh, we had to launch, and we launched. Uh, on top of a Cygnus OS 7 to ISS, and from there everything went right, and my GIF is not working right here. But you would see a deployment like you've seen that many times, so you can imagine that and how happy we were about that. And rightfully so, 30 minutes after that, we got the first beacon. I don't know if you can see that here, but that's in the middle, and then on the left and the right, you can see CW beacons uh, and then um, FSK beacons uh, right there. And what was really happy for us um, um, in terms of how we got us beacon it was that it was not even our ground station. And we, because we have the Satnox ground stations deployed around the world, that was picked up by one of our contributors uh, in Bloomington, Indiana. So the ground station network actually worked and you know, we got our first beacon, um, not even from our own ground station. And then we, you know, like, uh, course corrected the DLEs and we got the uh, better beacons uh, as we go and we saw, you know, charging cycles and we we're saying, yeah, that's working and that's great. And then after a couple of days, we started seeing problems with the uh, satellite itself. Um, we are almost certain what's happening on the satellite. The story has been that for the first couple of days, the satellite has been working pretty well. Uh, like performing on all the different things and we can see the beacons and everything else. And then at some point the satellite was not transmitting at all and then transmitting after that and then not transmitting at all and then transmitting after that. So it has interim cycles of, you know, power cycles basically. And we can identify that from the reset cycles and all the telemetry. And we think based on the telemetry that either of the two things is happening. The one being the heaters that were, or the heaters on the battery that have not been formally vetted in terms of the analysis of the thermal analysis and how much you know heat dissipations they're actually uh, causing and uh, they are probably working much more than they should uh, due to not thermal insulation around them. That's the one uh, theory that we have right now and they're consuming two watts which is a lot of overhead uh, when you're uh, up in space. And the other one uh, would be events on the STM32 of the EPS. Whenever the satellite works again, we actually see that the comms platform works really well, the OBC platform works really well, they're beaconing, they're sending status, the EPS uh, subsystem, not so much. So we're trying to replicate many of those things like on our engineering models down here uh, and figure out what it is. And when we have that, we're gonna be publishing an engineering report um, around that. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what the Upsat is and uh, where we would like to go with it. Frau Listo. Frau Listo.
Mr. Zapagas. Very interesting. Also, any question? Who is the first? Uh, thanks for the for the presentation. Um, so space missions are usually well, they usually work with waterfall methodology methodologies, but you have mentioned uh, uh, well, and that and the reason is because the the standards, the ACSS or, or any other standard, kind of forces you to do that. Well, not forces you, but they it are recommends you to do that. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and you, you mentioned that you have used uh, Agile methodologies and what's your opinion on that? How did you, did you find it was easy to, to do it or did you just skip part of the, of the standards or the testing was more difficult? How did you find that Agile methodologies in space? Yeah, so we've been uh, going a lot of um, um, on many discussions with the team around what we should use next, right? Like we kn we know that we used agile methodologies on on this mission, and then we were thinking, what could we change in order to avoid mistakes or you know what happened? Um, well, waterfall methodologies are not foolproof either, right? And one has advantages over other. The key concept, I think, is the way that you implement the Agile methodologies needs to be coupled with as early testing and diverse testing as possible. And if you don't do that, then you're actually worse than just following a typical waterfall uh, procedure. Uh, we didn't do that to the extent that we wanted it to do on UPSAT, uh, but we think that we have like the processes in place now. We're actually doing a lot of work around hardware in the loop testing early on. Um, and how can we incorporate it into the Agile software development itself. Um, and we feel confident that this is the way forward. And that's basically getting, abstracting best practices from other industries, not necessarily the space industry. Because we understand that no one else, well, if you know, they've done that in, in terms of Agile methodologies, we wouldn't necessarily know about it. Like we don't have published results about application of Agile methodologies in software and hardware in space. And we would like to see that more, uh, and we would like to invite you all to also share you know, uh, similar uh, experiences if you have. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an exploration, and you know, we're willing to, do to go down that road, because we think ultimately that's what's you know, innovative in terms of the development process. Question. Okay, then I hand over the presentation to <coughs> Red. Yeah, Haristo. Uh, huh? um, it's, it's fine. So this is time for the big break. We made it. We're all here. So um, 